This week, the blowout battle of the Forgotten State. Once this war was fought between some of the greatest generals in American history, commanding tens of thousands. This week, not so much. Outside of an unknown hamlet, the fate of the Confederacy hangs in the balance as two inexperienced officers lead their pitifully small force to death. Let's not dilly-dally. The first action this week is that battle in Florida. The initial goals of the expedition have been completed, but it hasn't ended yet. General Truman Seymour has gone beyond Major General Quincy Gilmore's instructions, and to great success. His army rapidly blitzed through the state's interior, met only nominal resistance. His army was confident, even if small, and he was within striking distance of the capital at Tallahassee. It appears as if his gamble has paid off, but not everyone is sure of success. Lincoln's eyes and ears of the expedition, Major John Hay, has severe doubts about Seymour's sanity. He doesn't share in the belief of the state's residents' loyalty, nor of the egotistical belief in the ultimate supremacy of the District of Florida. Seymour is short-sighted. He has left veteran companies as rearguards and has not trained raw recruits. His goal is speed. We might as well be rushing toward an open grave. Dusk opens, with the men singing songs of victory like we're bound for Tallahassee in the morning. That's a little on the nose. But they don't know that their march is anticipated. Many of those citizens who push loyalty to Seymour have been collaborating with Rebel General Joseph Finnegan. Finnegan has 5,000 men to take on Seymour's 5,500. Still, furthermore, his force is a mismatch of the veteran brigade of General Colquitt, which has been in battle since General Joseph Joseph commanded the Army of Northern Virginia, and that's a long time ago, and the brigade of Colonel George P. Harrison, which is not as experienced, to put it politely. Finnegan hopes to use this difference in strength to his advantage. He wishes to bait Seymour's army into a charge against breastwork, where his veterans, in addition to the fortifications, would decimate the Union ranks. <laughs> Though he would have wished for a different day to do battle, as the experienced 1st Georgia regulars are down 100 men due to vacation. What a great way to be a casualty! The sound of hoofs echoes as Union Colonel Guy Henry's Mets Brigade races to capture as much ground as they can. They are far from the infantry column they are supposed to be guarding, without any protection to their flanks. So often is the timid commander the problem, <clears throat> McClellan. But honestly, the audacity of Seymour is disturbing. Some of the infantry and artillery are marching without loading their pieces. To further demonstrate the incompetence, Seymour's column is structured thusly. Henry's Mountain Brigade, Colonel Hawley's Brigade, Colonel Barton's Brigade, then the supply train and medical vehicles with Montgomery's brigade in the back. Why would anyone deploy like this? But let's return to Colonel Henry. He spots through his binoculars five rebel riders and directs his men to open fire. These are the first shots of the Battle of Alusti. Those Confederates flood the mill they were standing by, rushing to the security of the main southern line. Not acting hastily, Henry holds his men to the mill and waits for infantry support. This is different from what Finnegan was hoping for, but he can work with it. He orders Colquitt to take most of his brigade and drive off the cavalry. When Finnegan receives word that these Union troopers are only supported by three regiments, which isn't true, he also orders Colonel Harrison to take the bulk of his force and join Colquitt in beating back the Federals. While this would mean advancing in front of the entrenchments, winning such a small force would be child's play, and the support of the secessionist soldiers was high. Comrades and soldiers of the 2nd Florida Cavalry, we are going to the fight to win. Though we are fighting five or six to one, we will die, but never surrender. General Seymour's army is made up largely of Negroes from Georgia and South Carolina. They have come to steal, pillage, run over the state, and murder, kill and rip our wives, daughters, and sweethearts. Let's teach them a lesson. We shall not take any Negro prisoners in this fight. When Colquitt reaches the front, he finds one of the raw Georgian regiments formed up. Their lack of battle experience is in full display as they have formed a square, which has been used to resist. Cavalry charges. But this kind of Napoleonic formation has yet to be seen on a battlefield as far as I can remember. With the Union cavalry bearing down, the regiment is ordered to form a battle line with the rest of the corps. By now, the blue clad infantry of Seymour have caught up with their mounted comrades. Colonel Hawley's brigade deploys the 7th Connecticut to skirmish with the enemy. The other Union regiments, the 7th New Hampshire and the 8th U.S. Colored Troops, are rushed to reinforce the stranded Yankees. They are marching into an unwinnable situation, greatly outnumbered, surrounded, and the ranks are about to be cut in droves. <laughs> Running besides the 8th United States Colored Troops is their mascot Lion, an old white dog who had no objection to being among black soldiers. Holly and Colquitt were once good friends, but that's the old army. 
The order is given with the two lines parallel to each other. The northern cannonade begins. There was artillery response, and the southern sharpshooters slowly pick off officers and artillerymen. This is quite effective, and it becomes apparent the battery under Captain Elder is too close to the rebel line. But the men had planned for this, setting up his cannons for a quick withdrawal. This is bolstered by the 365 men of the 7th Connecticut, who, with their 7-shot Spencer rifles, make their tiny 365-man force feel like a whole Union division. Now, boys, give them the 7 shooters. With this, the men rose and fired from the flank, the center, and finally, from the rear. The Confederate column broke, and the Connecticuters couldn't pursue, because they were out of ammunition. But the other two regiments were ready to seize the day. 45 minutes into the battle, two rebel regiments were repulsed at the cost of 69 Union men. Right now, Seymour needs to concentrate his force cleanly and not take the bait. Finnegan orders Colquitt to withdraw and drive the Yankees into his trap. Colquitt responds, It is no time to fall back, and send me more men. Finnegan followed this request, and Colquitt was probably right. After the deadly battle so far, withdrawing could lead to a rout. The struggle is before the breastworks, as the Federals form themselves inside rail lines, forming a semicircle. The shelling of the 7th New Hampshire is continuous, but inaccurate. Still, the real issue is that Seymour is an idiot. He gives complicated orders to his subordinate. The movement of the New Hampshire men is followed perfectly to their detriment. The companies crash into themselves as the 8th USCT marches alone. They start taking fire. One company is able to reinforce them, but the rest of the 7th Regiment is forced to fight from their confused position. The fight is unfair. They had to trade in their Spencers in return for Springfield rifles so the mounted soldiers could get the higher tack. And these Springfields are in a sorry state, except for the 10th Company, who got to keep theirs. The 10th Company is the one with the USCT. Unsurprisingly, most of the 7th New Hampshire fled, though some 200 men were rallied. Another 209 were casualties. This left the 8th Regiment alone, holding the Federal left flank as the artillery and supply situation was up in the air. The field is terrible. The men have not loaded their weapons nor weaved themselves of their knapsacks. The double quick, they formed nearly 200 yards from the enemy. Lieutenant Oliver Norton, a veteran of Will Roundtop, spoke of this moment. Military men say it takes veteran troops to maneuver under fire, but our regiment with knapsacks on and loaded pieces after a run of half a mile formed a line under the most destructive fire I ever knew. We're not more than 200 yards from the enemy, concealed in pits and behind trees. And what did the regiment do? At first they were stunned, bewildered, and knew not what to do. They curled to the ground, and as men fell around them they seemed terribly scared. But gradually they recovered their senses, commenced firing. Here was the great trouble. They could not use their arms to their advantage. We have had very little practice in firing. And though they could stand and be killed, they could not kill a concealed enemy fast enough to satisfy my feelings. Not that one could blame these ex-slaves for not knowing how to load and fire their pieces, as they had no training. Not that their Colonel Charles Fibley hadn't multiple times requested practice, only to be refused, because in my completely unbiased opinion, Seymour is an idiot. While even veteran units would falter, unwilling to become slaughtered, and untrained regiments would have fled after the first shot, but not the 8th United States Colored Troops. These men have heard Davis's policy. They'd be returned to slavery or killed, and their officers would be brutally executed. To all, it was better to die on the field than suffer the terrible fate of bondage. Fibley is soon killed only after giving the order to fall back. This retreat is terrible. The battery behind them is left with no defense, and the regiment breaks into separate groups, which are soon cut down. There was no leader. Seymour might better have been in his grave than there. Seriously, everyone hates Seymour. Two Union heavy guns are captured. This is blamed on the 8th USCT, but that's unfair. As I said, no other regiment would have lasted that long, nor could the battery be saved because it had not the horses nor men to withdraw. Was the 8th supposed to win the battle alone? Hamilton, the commander of the battery, wrote, By the sacrifice of five pieces of artillery, I saved the whole of our left flank from breaking and its disastrous consequences. The 8th USCT should not be condemned, for I saw nothing wrong that could not be accounted for by want of experience and ignorance of object, apparently. The 8th USCT is finally withdrawn after 90 minutes of the grueling massacre. They lost 210 men of the 550 they started with, but brought honor to themselves. Here they stood for two hours and a half under one of the most terrible fires I ever witnessed, and here, on the field of Awusti, it was decided whether the colored man had the courage to stand without shelter and risk the dangers of the battlefield. When I tell you that they stood with a fire in front, in their flanks and in their rear, for two hours, without flinching, 
And when, when I tell you the number of dead and wounded, I have no doubt as to the verdict of every man who has gratitude for the defenders of his country, white or black. The more staff surgeon sets up a hospital. He has no buildings that aren't exposed, so he instead goes to treat. But the Confederate artillery forces the hospital to be moved to the rear as the mass of wounded men pours in. So far, Seymour has only had one third of his force on the field of battle, made things far easier than Colquitt expected. He has time to rest and redeploy his line, shifting artillery around to cover the center of the battlefield. He then decides to split command because I guess screw Finnegan, tells Colonel George Harrison to cover the left half of the battlefield. Harrison is a native Georgian, a student of the military academy at Georgia, comes from an illustrious family, but he is no Colquitt. So far, the Union has lost three regiments and five cannons. The battle is to go in favor of the South, but a new player has entered the field, Colonel William B. Barton and his New Yorkers. The 47th, 48th, and 115th New York Infantry are fresh for the fight. They form up on the right with the remnants of the 7th Connecticut and 8th USCT, holding their flank and bringing up their artillery. These recent arrivals are unexpectedly galvanized by the sight of their wounded comrades wishing to avenge the fallen. These men gladly rushed to the battle, but for some, they didn't even make it. The rebel artillery has found its mark. Well, one piece. The batteries under Finnegan are inaccurate and haven't done much harm, but a 64-pound swivel on a car on the railroad has fired canisters and grape shot on the Union enfilade, causing entire companies to be cut away. Not wishing to stay in the slaughter, the New Yorkers advance. They thin their line, hoping to cover the entire Confederate battle line. Then the order is given, and a volley is opened upon the Bluebacks. Its effects are catastrophic. The Union does not falter and fires back, and a proper fire duel begins. Men cry for their mothers. Some merely focus on the loading and firing of their piece. The shrieks of the wounded and dying are heard by all. But some bodies can't be seen through the smoke. The fire of the secessionists subside. Not to the superior shooting of the New Yorkers, but to the absence of ammunition. The commotion caused by the Confederate cartridges has brought Finnegan to his fate. His desperate desire to keep the Union at bay and support Colquitt has left his army vulnerable. He has no option but to order his men to fix bayonets in advance. Colquitt responds to a report of the ammunition situation. Let the men hold their ground. This faith may or may not be warranted, but Colquitt must have known that the supplies he so desperately requires or half a mile away on train tracks. He had no way of knowing if they were coming his way, so instead he dismounted his horse. At this time, it was when both he and his steed had taken fire, and told a staff officer to ride to the train and ride back with cartridges. The order is then redirected to his staff and couriers. They are all on supply duty. Against all hope, the rebel riders return, holding the cartridges in all manner of ways. They go back and forth many times, ensuring that the Confederate line never entirely ran out of shot and ball. As the Georgian regiments are about to advance for their charge, they are handed the cartridges and spot a regiment in the distance. Is it friend or foe? Friend. It's the 1st Florida Infantry Battalion, and unfortunately it has stabilized the secessionist situation. One staff officer of Colquitt, also named Colquitt, rode up and down the line, waving the colors and urging his men to stand their ground. The two sides are about to clash in a bayonet charge. Then the rebels get their ammunition, soon they start delivering volleys. The crisis of Colquitt is over. The crisis of the 115th New York has just begun. They're being pressed from their right flank, and the Confederate cannons have started to find their mark, delivering hellish shells. Through all that confusion, rebel sharpshooters hiding behind grass and trees picked off men, removing any semblance of organization. The wounded dragged themselves back to the hospital, only for a southern shell to explode, wiping out some hospital staff. To make matters worse, the cartridges of the 115th are running out. They're outgunned, outnumbered, about to be outmaneuvered. They defiantly fix their steel bayonets. Seymour asked, What stone wall is that standing there? Okay, Seymour, you're trying for the Stonewall Jackson quote. He then orders the regiment to withdraw, but to fall back facing the enemy. Colonel Sammons, who leads the regiment, rides along the line after being wounded twice, explaining the order to his men. The slow withdrawal prompted Colonel Barton to order Sammons to hurry back. The order was ignored. Another message sent, another ignored. Finally, on the third order, Sammons told the courier, Give my compliments to General Barton and tell him to go to hell. I will fall back with my regiment when I am ready to do so. 
With the escape of the 115th proving an excellent success for Seymour, so was the loss of the 48th New York a crowning failure. The regiment was low on ammunition, pressed from multiple places, and soon overrun. Barton has reason to praise his regiments. They showed gallantry and distinguished valor. The final of his regiments, the 47th New York, is about to be crushed. They are surrounded and completely at the mercy of Colquitt. They suffer volley after volley from the left, right, and center, but don't break. Union soldiers return fire, but their ammunition runs low, so they resort to picking up the cartridges of their dead and wounded comrades. <laughs> Union is about to break, and Colonel James Montgomery's brigade reaches the field just in time. Colonel Montgomery leads the African Brigade, made up of two regiments, the 54th Massachusetts of Fort Wagner fame and the 1st North Carolina Colored Infantry. The 1st North Carolina are the 35th U.S. Colored Troops. Still, they wish to fight under their original banner until the end of this campaign. The two black regiments rush to form the battle line ahead of the broken New York Brigade. They are again outnumbered, facing off against the entire rebel force, the last defense standing against a tidal wave of gray, and are already exhausted. They are coming off their 18-mile march, having only taken a 30-minute break before marching the final six miles. They didn't wait for orders when they heard the sound of battle, marching under Montgomery's command alone because screw Seymour. They throw their knapsacks, haversacks, and the random equipment they had before finishing in a run over Sam. A staff officer of Seymour goes to Colonel Edward Howell, the commander of the 54th. For God's sake, Colonel, double quick or the day is lost. Sadly, one fool accidentally discharges their weapon early, killing them and their comrade. I have lost faith in Seymour's army. The Brigade of Montgomery has to make its way through the wounded stragglers, who discouraged them greatly. We are badly whipped. You all be killed. Three cheers from Massachusetts and seven dollars a month. The reply of Sergeant Garnet Caesar references the unequal pay given to black soldiers. It's the rallying cry of the 54th. Compelled by the sounds of battle, the regiment moved forward. General Seymour reaches the 54th and says to Colonel Howell, Colonel, we have lost everything. It all now depends upon your regiment. The desperation of Seymour is felt. Once the 500 men of the 54th can hold the line, the army will be annihilated. It's a lot to ask of this veteran but undersized unit. They lost many of their best men at Battery Wagner. Of their best companies behind as guards. Seymour leaves Colonel Howe to clean up his mess. He goes to the chief signal officer and gives him an assignment. A number of officers were behind trees, and I was told to order them into the front rank of the nearest regiment, no matter whether their own or not. The general rides, rallying anyone and sending everyone into the fight, exposing himself to enemy fire. Colonel Hawley tells his commander not to endanger himself. He is given a sharp reply. Would we lose anything if Seymour took that bullet? But back to the 54th. The regiment lets out their hearty cheers, which inspires the 47th New York and lets them know help is on the way. The regimental band breaks into the Star-Spangled Banner, which rallies some retreating New Yorkers and New Hampshireites. This saves the Union line. The 115th New York follows the 54th back to the battle. Or the 1st North Carolina. It's up to debate. By now, it is 1600 hours, with only one remaining before nightfall, which should end the conflict. If Montgomery's brigade could hold, Seymour would be able to extricate his army, and the Federal Army would whip to fight another day. The black troops could not stem the Confederate advance, all would be lost. And Seymour's little army would likely be gobbled up and eliminated as a fighting force. Defeat was apparent. Disaster could yet be avoided. Montgomery orders his regiments to form a 120 degree angle, a V formation. The commander falls back, directing his brigade from a stump. He witnessed the 54th's first volley stop the entire Confederate advance. Rebels return fire, and snipers and sharpshooters of the South get to work. Many men become overly excited and forget the ramrods in the rifles, firing them as if it was a spear. This leaves the ramrodless soldiers with nothing to do until they are to hit the butt of their musket to the ground to load the musket. This works, and many men in the regiment find this way of firing even better. Their fire is done quickly, having a white soldier armed with the impressive breech loaders. Ha! Ah, you fellows have breech loaders too! A scream as the color guard takes their casualties. One member of the 54th, with great passion, begins to run closer to the rebels to deliver his fire. The quick fire of these brave men soon eats up the 20,000 rounds they started with. The regiment's bravery is properly reported. Fought like tigers, the 54th did honor to themselves and us city. All concede that no regiment fought like it. Pitched three Negro regiments against us, and all acknowledge that they fought well. Rebels can overcome and move in to flank the Union, forcing Colonel Montgomery from his stump seat. 
running with his staff in front of the Union line, studying his men. Urged the regiment personally to concentrate. Fire to the left! Fire to the left! On the right, though, Lieutenant Colonel Homan spots exposed Confederate guns and orders the charge only to be called back. The men are itching to beat the Confederates. The color bearers march ahead of the line, but are also called back. With the line stable, the cartridges are resupplied. We are saved! They're the wrong caliber. We are fucked. Colonel Montgomery, suffering from panic, ordered the regiment to be dispersed. Lieutenant Colonel Henry Hooper, who has taken over this unit as Colonel Howell is missing, ignores the order and tells his men to fix bayonets and hold the position. Seymour planned the 1st North Carolina to drive the Confederate left flank from the field. This is way beyond the possibilities of a single regiment. Lieutenant Colonel of the regiment orders the charge, which breaks the Confederate front line. But they are exhausted. The rebels return fire on them. The entire command is slaughtered. The color guard is cut to pieces. But the heroic state of this regiment is well noted, even if this meat grinder eats it. No regiment went into action more gallantly, or did better execution than the 1st North Carolina troops. Their third in command is killed, a most tragic loss. Captain Charles Jones, a non-commissioned officer of the 21st Massachusetts Infantry, was ready to make him the commanding officer. He refused the offer and said accepted a commission in the 1st North Carolina. He's one of the white officers of the USCT. His men love him. The regiment struggles to reclaim the body when he dies, with no one willing to let their commander go. The dedication and stubbornness of this raw regiment are inspiring. Its losses, horrifying. 230 casualties, and they lose their national flag. The first North Carolina is forced from the field. The surgeon runs around, making sure the black wounded are removed first. I know what will become of the white troops who fall into the enemy's possession. But I'm not certain as to the fate of the colored troops. With the loss of the 1st North Carolina, the 54th faces the full attention of the Confederates. General Seymour is sacrificing them to get away. 1730 hours, and the battle should be over, but hell remains. The 54th has been holding out when the order comes in to fall back. This is surprising because the 54th assumed they were winning. Their commander orders them to give nine cheers to trick the rebels into thinking there are reinforcements. With that, they about face and orderly march off the field. Thus ends the Battle of Aloosti. The 54th lost 84 men out of their 530. The Union of 5,500 suffered 34% injured and 1,861 casualties. The Confederates are luckier, suffering only 17% casualties with 946 total losses. The Union casualties, 503 were from the African regiments. What a shame. The men of the 54th were sacrificed, and when the Confederates went over their bodies, it seemed as if they had suffered massively. Almost all of them had multiple bullet marks. But these aren't from battle. The Battle of Aloosti is over, but here comes the Massacre of Aloosti. Finnegan dominated the day, taking five cannons, 1,600 guns, and most prized, the regimental flag. The pursuit of Seymour is slow. We have taken up a more horrifying task. Union has been pushed out of Florida, never to return. But this does not satisfy some of Finnegan's rank. The darkness overtook them, and they demanded revenge. The captured black prisoners and wounded are individually killed. The Negro had a shot in the shin, another was sure to be in the head. Drew back his musket, and with the butt gave him a blow that killed him instantly. A very few wounded were placed on the surgeon's operating table. Their legs fairly flew off. Walked over a woolly head. All bars did walk into the... They would beg and pray, but it did no good. Rebel officer happened to see him and said, Ah, you black rascal, you will not remain here long. Snouting from his horse, he placed his revolver close to the Negro's head and blew his brains out. Water is horrifying. When General Seymour tries to figure out what is happening, Ficken lies and says prisoners are adequately taken care of. The fear of black troops and the lies about their barbarity and murder soaked too far into the minds of those demons. Finnegan calls off any effective pursuit as Seymour limps back to the coast, relying on the 54th to fix his problems. So they are called upon to rescue the wounded when a train goes off the tracks. They have to put the train right back on and save even more lives. Both sides are reinforced as it becomes clear that the failed Florida expedition is worse than imaginable. The entire state must be abandoned, ensuring the dead soldiers won't get a proper funeral. God damn it, Seymour! That is the biggest disappointment this week. But for something even slightly close, we turn to Meriden, Mississippi, where after pillaging the town for a week, Sherman leads his army back to Vicksburg, tearing up railroads. Rebels see this and return to Meriden, fixing the damage. 
I had high hopes for Grant's disciple, but old William Sherman has been a letdown. Not as much as his cavalry, though. General William Soy Smith is a man too incompetent for command, but through gross misjudgment, got one. He's been pursuing the devil himself, Nathan Bedford Forrest. And getting ripped by the rebel every which way. After hearing of Sherman's withdrawal, he begins to fall back. On the 21st, he was ambushed in the swamps of West Point. 22nd, it's a full-on battle. Union horse riders dismounted and constructed rudimentary barricades. This does not deter the wizard of the saddle, who launched frontal attacks with unbelievable energy. When his frontal assault falters, he probes the flanks, which, under his pressure, soon break. Union is thrown into panic, but reforms on high ground, <laughs> steadying themselves on a ridge. The Southerners charge and are countercharged. In a smoke-filled chaos, Mini Ball finds its mark, killing Forrest! Colonel Forrest, Mayor General Forrest's younger brother, lamenting his death and kissing him on the forehead goodbye. The anger and desire for vengeance builds in him. He charges and cuts through the Union, pursuing them for miles, cutting them down with volley fire. <laughs> By the end of the day, he had inflicted 388 casualties, suffering only 144. But of course, nothing can fill the place of Colonel Jeffrey Forrest. Smith limps back towards Vicksburg. Confederates running low on ammunition call off their pursuit. But local militias continue to engage with the Union cavalry. When it rains, it pours. And Port Lincoln doesn't just have to deal with military defeats, but also political threats. The cabinet is filled with personalities and political rivals. Edward Bates, the Attorney General, William Seward, Secretary of State, and Simon P. Chase, Secretary of the Treasury, all sought the Republican nomination for the 1860 election, losing to President Lincoln. This hasn't stopped these men from pursuing the highest office in the land, and none more than Chase. As Benjamin Wade once quipped, Chase is a good man, but his theology is unsound. He thinks there's a fourth person in the Trinity. What brings this egotistical man into the conflict this time? Pomery Circular. As Chase is a radical Republican, and Lincoln a moderate, these two party factions have been battling for the 1864 nomination. While this dispute has long been well known, it was a public secret. When it is published in the newspaper, there is hell to pay. What has caused the big rift now is a pamphlet by Senator Pomeroy of Kansas that advocated for Lincoln to be denied the nomination and directed top Republicans to support Chase instead. No knowledge of the existence of this letter before I saw it in the Constitutional Union. I do not wish to minister to the Treasury Department one day without your entire confidence. Yours of yesterday in relation to the paper issued by Senator Pomeroy was duly received. And I write this note merely to say I will answer a little more fully when I can find the leisure to do so. On the 23rd, the cabinet meets without Chase. Chase admits that he met with Senator Pomeroy, among other participants in this scheme, but denied knowledge of the circular. A bold lie. As all this tension builds, Lincoln receives a report on the Louisiana governor election. The moderate Republican Michael Hahn won, being the conservative Jay Fellows, and last place was the radical Benjamin Flanders. Hahn and Flanders were the two representatives in the House. The victory of the more moderate spells doom for the Pomeroy plot. Representative John Blair resumes charges on Chase's character. The newspaper's nationwide voice loud support for Lincoln. Chase's plot is defeated. Lincoln, on the 24th, shows off his political capital by approving a plan to free slaves who enlist, but pay their former enslavers with compensation. Show of independence from the conservatives, who disagree with enlistment, and rebuke of the radicals, who support no payment. The same day as Lincoln's triumph was Davis's mistake. Braxton Bragg was removed from command after his complete failure at Chattanooga. But as a friend of Davis, he received orders. Charged with the conduct of military operations of the Confederate States. This makes him chief of staff. I agree with Longstreet, who writes on this occasion that Davis promotes failures and suppresses successes. The Confederate army is a mess, and its command structure barely exists. I hope that Bragg continues his record of failure. I'm sure another rebel will take his place if he doesn't. Not even a day later does another failure occur. General John C. Breckinridge gets a command, the Trans-Allegheny Department, or just Western Virginia, the flank of Richmond. Is Davis trying to lose? As we began with Union competence and continue with Confederate incompetence, how will it end? Oh, Union genius, particularly Major General George Henry Thomas, a man who has never lost a battle. He probes General Joseph Johnson's line, detecting any weakness after two divisions left the Army of Tennessee to stop Sherman, who stopped himself. Each day, Union columns meet and skirmish, giving Thomas vital information. However, it all points to the sad reality that the rebels are not vulnerable. Bell continues next week. Then there is Sickles, and the visit to Arkansas has become a debacle. 
I hope you will not send General Sickles here. An order has been made to that effect that it may be revoked. His coming here would only be an annoyance and will do no good. Everything is working well. General Steele is doing everything that can be done. Governor Murphy's letter is received, but not needed. Plans have changed. Sending a telegram to Steele. General Sickles is not going to Arkansas. He will probably make a tour down the Mississippi and home by the Gulf and Ocean, but he will not meddle in your affairs. Please show this to Governor Murphy to save me telegraphing him. What's this tour? Well, Lincoln wants Sickles to go from Charleston to Key West, Florida, to New Orleans, to Vicksburg, to Memphis. Basically, all of the South that we doesn't fight in. He is to ascertain at each place what is being done, if anything, for reconstruction. He doesn't stop there. He is also to see over the amnesty policy that would see Confederates take the Pledge of Allegiance. But it goes even further. Sickles is also to look at the status of African Americans. How they get along as soldiers, as laborers in our service, on Lee's plantation, and as hired laborers with their old masters, if there be such cases. Lincoln has made the perfect choice. Sickles might have only one leg, but he has all the energy needed to make this four-month trek. He was the only man savvy enough in politics as a survivor of New York and federal politics, and of the army politics, as a former and, hopefully future, corps commander. But before he can help out Lincoln, he needs to help another friend. But that story is for next week. Now to close this episode. God damn it, Seymour! This was supposed to be a straightforward campaign, and we know it's his fault. The rearguard action showed the discipline and bravery of his men. The arrogance of that man. Well, I'm not worried about the future of the Union. This battle is of no great consequence. Mary enraged by the honorable Union soldier being betrayed by idiotic command. But such is this war. Hello, it's the entire Civil War by We Team here. I would just like to thank every single one of you for watching this video. Your support means the world to me, and I really do hope to see you next week.